Let There Be Life is the authorised biography of Robert Edwards. I'd like to read you an extract from the introduction. This is the story of a miner's son who brought a revolution to medical science. It is the life of Robert Edwards, an affable Yorkshireman called Bob by his friends and colleagues, and hailed around the world as the father of in vitro fertilization, or IVF. He dismissed the flattering tribute, saying that a team of relay runners is needed to finish a long race, but his leg of the course demanded the most stamina and dogged determination. It took more than brilliance and Edward's luck. The winner needed character, charisma, and the gift of a robust constitution. The history of his career is a list of firsts. The first fertilization of human ova in vitro, first test tube baby, first embryonic stem cells, and first genetic testing of microscopic embryos. After those achievements, he didn't sit back for accolades and awards, but rolled up his sleeves again to apply science for people with the heartache of infertility or family histories of dreaded disease or disability. In opening the first IVF clinic in the world, he became a biomedical entrepreneur, a role added to an overfilled life as a university teacher, globe-trotting lecturer, politician, scientific publisher, hobby farmer, and proud family man. His energy was as legendary as his legacy. He didn't come from a privileged background, except for the immense advantage of a mother's ambition for her son and loyal helpers, many of them women. It is not surprising then that his work would eventually benefit women's health and family building. But there were no other indications that his arrow would fly. At university, he nearly failed his degree, but enjoyed soft landings afterwards at research centres under eminent mentors in Edinburgh, California and London before finally settling in Cambridge. His greatest luck was to marry Ruth Fowler, and he was lucky, or visionary, to collaborate with Patrick Steptoe and appoint Jean Purdy as an assistant. But it wasn't an easy race to his goal, and after golden years, there were tragedies. It was an uphill struggle to study human embryos against the gravity of political, scientific, and theological opposition. Some authorities called him crazy. Others said he was a murderer. The problem of so-called generation had tantalized some of the greatest minds in the history of science, including Aristotle and William Harvey. They wanted to know where babies come from, said by some to be sacred knowledge that should be off limits to research. So when Bob came along, hoping to create embryos in his petri dish, he was accused of playing God. Branded Dr. Frankenstein, it was a foolish label that did not stick because IVF is a cooperation between nature and medicine to help struggling life to flourish. He was first to lay groundwork for the ethical care of embryos in vitro and to urge responsible research before clinical application. These were foundations for the social acceptance of a controversial technology and legislation for a booming baby-making industry in the future. It took passion, but was it a narcissistic ambition or did it have deeper roots? Bob wore his celebrity status lightly. He grew up in a family and community that had experienced hardship and world wars and had observed conflict and suffering firsthand, although never a victim himself. It was natural for an optimistic young man in the post-World War II generation to admire science 
justice and equality as hallmarks of a progressive era. By chance, he landed in a field ripe for development and close to that dearest hope of humanity, raising healthy children. IVF was his great gift and noble achievement, borne out by five million births in the year of his death and will soon double in number. His two closest colleagues never lived to see so much flourishing and for him, the fulfilment of patients' hopes was the greatest reward because the acclaim of a Nobel Prize and knighthood from Her Majesty the Queen was almost too late.